Before we start the video, I want to mention that I just released a book called A Beginner's Guide to Lua for Game Development. This is a book that's meant to take you from no experience with coding and teach you all the basics of how to program using the Lua programming language. It's not Playdate specific, it's just meant to teach Lua, but if you're a beginner and want a resource to help you learn how to code, check out the link in the description. Alright, back to the tutorial. Hey, welcome back to another Playdate tutorial. This week we're talking about scene management. Let's say in your game you have a title screen, but you also have a bunch of different areas like outside of a cave and inside of a cave. A convenient way to think about each of those screens is as its own self-contained scene. Game engines like Unity or Godot have their own built-in system of scenes, but the Playdate SDK has no such thing. So if we want to create some sort of scene system, it's up to us. Because it's up to us, that means there are literally an infinite number of ways of going about creating a scene management system. This means it's really a personal choice for what you want to do. However, what I can do is share a few ways to go about doing it. First, I'll start off by going over some very simple implementations. Then I'm going to go over the one I've been using for my own games, which has some pros and cons. And at the end, I'll cover some alternatives. The simplest way to think about scenes is as different states. Let's take the game Snake, for example. When you're playing, you're in the game state, which allows you to move the snake around. However, if you hit a wall or yourself, you can't move anymore, and you're moved over to a game over state. In this situation, a simple if statement in your update loop is more than enough. You can create a local variable and assign a scene name to it, and check that variable in the update loop to do different things. You can even choose to be a little bit more fancy and create an enum by using a table, and assigning set scene names to it and checking against that. An alternative is you can even replace the update function entirely by creating different update functions and setting playdate.update to those functions. If for your game this feels sufficient, you can stop here. But I find as things get more complicated, and especially if you want transitions between the different scenes, it makes more sense to go beyond just this simple state definition. Game engines like Unity and Godot have a different definition for what a scene is. In those game engines, a scene is its own self-contained object. The object has its own life cycle, which is mainly consisted of its initialization and its update. It's kind of an oversimplification, but generally those are the two important parts. You can think of initialization as setting up the scene, like creating all the images in a title screen or generating all the tiles of a room. And the update as something like moving this wave up and down on the title screen or taking the player input and moving the character around the screen. Now, conveniently, the Playdate SDK actually does have something that is a self-contained object that has its own initialization and update function, which is a sprite. If you don't know what a sprite is, you can check out my video about sprites. We can utilize those features of the sprite class by extending the sprite into a subclass and use that subclass as our scene itself and just ignore all the graphical elements of the sprite. If you don't know what I'm talking about with classes, objects, or object-oriented programming, you can check out my video about that as well. I'm going to make two example scenes. This first one is one with just a simple background and a player, and the player can move around. Here's what that looks like. We start off by creating a new file and a new class called game scene that extends the sprite class. In the init method, I'll do everything required to set up the scene, which is just creating the background and the player sprites. Crucially, I make sure to add the add method on the scene itself at the end. If we don't do that, the update method for the scene will not be called. As a refresher, what happens when you add a sprite, it gets added to the sprite list. In the main playdate update function, when you call the sprite update function here, part of the update step is it loops through that sprite list and executes every update method. In the update method, I'll take in some player input and move the player around. This is the core update loop for the scene. Personally, I found that I quite like this setup. Everything is very self-contained, and any sort of data that is important to the scene, I can just store in the scene object itself as a property, like the player speed, and can be retrieved from any place within the scene class. The second scene just looks like this, a simple game over scene with some text. I'll create another file in class called game over scene that extends the sprite class, and in the init method, I'll draw the text and add the scene to the draw list. The update method I'll leave empty for now and we'll come back to that later. There may be many different ways to go about creating a scene management system, but the one thing I recommend for every approach is to use some sort of scene manager. The scene manager will look different based on your approach, but in any case, it'll make things a lot easier. You can copy it between projects, it can handle transitions, and all you have to do is call a simple switch scene function. Let me show you how I made my scene manager. Let's create another file in class called scene manager. This time, I won't be extending the sprite class since we don't need any of the sprite functionality or the update method. And also, when switching between scenes, we'll be removing all the sprites and we don't want the scene manager to be removed as well. I'll create a method called switch scene that takes in one argument, which is the scene that we want to switch to. What we pass in here will be one of the references to the scene classes we've created. 
I'll go ahead and store this into a property called new scene. I'll then call a method we haven't made yet called load new scene. Let's create that method now. First, I'm going to call the remove all function that will remove all the sprites from the game. This is so we can clear the previous scene. Of course, I'm making the assumption that everything in a scene is somehow attached to a sprite. And if you set up your scene like I've done before, or something similar where all your relevant game objects are sprites, then this will serve to remove every active thing in the game. However, one thing that is frequently separate from the sprite operation are timers. If you don't want your timers from one scene to keep on running, you'll have to remove them. As of now, there's no convenient function to remove all the timers, so I'll create a small method that gets all the timers and loops through them to remove them all one by one. We can then call that method right after removing all the sprites. Sometimes I mess with the draw offset, so if you do that as well, that can be reset here too. Your game might be different and you might need to remove more or less things, so any scene cleanup can be done here. In fact, let's just split this off into a separate method. Of course, if you need something to be persistently running between scenes, you'll have to come up with something for that separately, like some sort of global singleton. You could also pass data between scenes, which I'll cover in a bit. In order to initialize our new scene, we can simply call the new scene property as a function. This works since Lua has first class functions. Let's head over to our main file and create an instance of our scene manager. I'll start off by importing it, and then I'll create a single global variable that's set to a single instance of scene manager. You can think of the scene manager object as a global singleton, similar to how you might create a singleton in Unity using the static keyword or in Godot using autoload. I'll go ahead and import the game scene and initialize it here to make it the first scene that loads in the game. Notice how short the update function is. This is because we're essentially hiding all the game updates behind the sprite update function. Now, how do we use the scene manager? In the game scene, I'll import the game over scene at the top. Then we'll create a condition to go to the game over scene in the update method. Normally, it might be when the player health hits zero, but for this example, I'll just make it when you press the A button. We can then call the switch scene method on the scene manager singleton and pass in our game over scene class. In the game over scene, we'll do the same thing, importing the game scene and then switching to it when the A button is pressed. If we run this, you should see that whenever we press A, it switches the scene. Sometimes this might be all you need. However, usually you'll want to transition. I'll show you three different examples of transitions you could implement. But before that, I mentioned something about passing data between scenes. Let's go back to the scene manager class. We'll add one new parameter to the switch scene method, which is this ellipses. This is a special syntax that represents a variable number of arguments. So you can pass in zero arguments or five, and they'll all be represented by these three dots. I'll save this into another property called scene args. Then when we load the new scene, we'll pass in scene args. As an example of how this might work, I'll change the game over scene init method to take in one argument, which is the text to display. In the game scene, when we switch scenes, I'll pass in some text as a second argument. Now, when we run the game, you'll see that when we switch scenes, the text from the game scene is passed over to the game over scene. Let's get to transitions. For the first transition, let's create this simple wipe animation. This is what it'll look like. The transition is really a sprite that's getting clipped. So the first thing we want to make is a screen size sprite. I'll create a method called create transition sprite and start by creating a completely black image the size of the screen, which is 400 by 240 pixels. Then we can create a sprite with that image. I'll go ahead and move it to the center of the screen and also make the Z index very high so the transition is drawn over everything. If you're using draw offsets, it's also important to set the transition sprite to ignore the draw offset to make sure it gets drawn over the entire screen. We'll then go ahead and add the sprite and then return a reference to it since we'll need it later. Next, let's make another method called wipe transition. Here, I'll take in two arguments, the start value of the wipe and the end value, since we'll need to swap which direction the wipe is drawn from. We'll create a transition sprite using the method we just created and then store it into a variable. We'll start off by setting a clip rec on the sprite to make sure the transition starts off where we want it to. When we start the transition, we want the sprite to be completely clipped so nothing is there. But what will happen is the transition animation will start, and the moment the sprite is blocking the screen, we'll swap out the scenes in the background, and then create a new transition sprite that needs to start completely unclipped, covering the screen, and then we'll animate it back. To animate it, we'll be using timers because of the handy callback function we can use. First, before we forget, I'll create an initialization method for the scene manager and initialize the transition time. I'll set this to 1000 milliseconds, so the entire transition will take double that amount for a total of 2 seconds. Going back down to the wipe transition method, I'll create a new timer. First, I'll pass in how long the timer should last, which is the transition time. Then, I'll pass in the start and end value. And finally, I'll pass in an easing function. I'll use the in-out cubic function here, but you can mess around with changing the easing function to see what you like. For example, the out bounce function will look like this. Next, we'll set an update callback on the timer. 
This makes it so every frame the timer is active, this function is called. We'll create an anonymous function that takes in the timer, and inside of it, we'll set a clip rect on the transition sprite. The first two arguments are the top left coordinates of the clip rect, which we can just set to 0, 0. The next two arguments are the width and height. Since we'll be animating the width of the rect for the transition, we can use the timer value for that width. The height can just stay as 240, the height of the screen. Finally, we'll return the transition timer, since we'll be using that for our next method. The last method we'll need to implement is something to put everything together. I'll create a new method called start transition that will kick off the transition. First, we'll create a wipe transition, starting from 0 and ending at 400, the width of the screen. However, we'll want to add a timer-ended callback to the timer, to do something when the timer ends. The thing we'll want to do is load the new scene, and then kick off another wipe transition in the opposite direction. Then, in the switch scene method, instead of directly calling load new scene, we'll call start transition instead. If we set up everything right, when you run the game and switch scenes, you should see this nice wipe effect instead. There's one small quirk, however, that we might want to address. Currently, if you switch scenes, you can switch scenes again before the first transition ends. We might want to disable scene transitions while transition is occurring. I'll create a transitioning property in the init method and set it to false. Then, in the switch scene method, if transitioning is true, we'll immediately return so that nothing happens. If we're not currently transitioning, then we can set transitioning to true. In the start transition method, I'll add a timer ended callback to the second transition timer, which will be called when the entire transition finishes, and we can set the transitioning property to false. One simple alternative to this transition is if we want a different background to appear when transitioning. This is really simple, as we can just switch the filled rec image with the image that we want. Then we can get this transition effect. Another popular transition is the fade effect. To achieve this, let's first make a method called getFadedImage that takes in the alpha value of the image. We'll create a new image the size of the screen. Then we can use push context on this image. Next, we'll create a filled rect and then use the draw faded method to draw a faded black rectangle. The first two arguments are the x and y coordinates, which we can just set to 0, 0. The next argument is the alpha value, which we'll just set to the alpha argument passed in. The final argument is the dithering type. I used bare 8x8 here, but you can switch it to another dither type. Then we can pop the context and return the image. We can then proceed to copy the wipe transition and rename it to fade transition. Instead of setting the clip rect in the second line, We'll set the transition to a faded image with the alpha set to the start value. Inside the update callback, instead of setting the clip rec, we'll set the transition sprite image to a faded image based on the timer value. Then, in start transition, let's call fade transition instead. First, from 0 to 1 to fade from the alpha of 0 to 1. And then from 1 to 0. If we run this, you can see the fade effect taking place. One small issue is that draw faded is a pretty computationally expensive operation so there will be a slight performance drop during the transition. You can get around the issue by pre-computing all the faded images and caching them, and retrieving the cached images instead. Really quickly, here's how you might do that. At the top of the file, you can create a local variable set to an empty table. We can loop from 0 to 1 in increments of 0.01 .01, and create a faded filled rectangle with an alpha value set to the loop variable. We can then cache that image into our table with an index coerced into a range from 0 to 100. This is because the timer will not give us nice rounded values, so we can use the floor function to find the nearest alpha value to an image we've pre-computed. The loop doesn't hit the last image, so we'll just set that manually. In the getFadedImage method, we can then return a value from our faded rex cache instead. This resolves the performance issue. There are a few drawbacks to the scene management approach. The first is, as I mentioned before, it's not really designed to have persistent elements between scenes. That also means you can't have some sort of overlay scene, like an inventory or pause screen, which would require a different approach. Since a scene is completely cleared, you also have to reinitialize the scene every time, which has some performance implications. You could have a load screen between scenes to work around that issue, but the current system is not designed to handle that, so you would need to refactor the system. The system also doesn't save anything from a previous scene, though you could relatively simply cache all the sprites in a scene when you switch scenes. If you want to know which scene you switched from, or you want to have some sort of cleanup when a scene exits, there's not an explicit way to do that right now but that would probably be pretty simple to add. The scene management system is also completely dependent on everything being sprites, as mentioned before, which might not match your game architecture. Finally, inputs are not blocked during the transition, which may be an issue, but that's more dependent on how I handle inputs in the demo. If you use input handlers for your inputs, you can simply push an input handler at the start of the scene and then pop it when switching scenes. If you went through this entire thing and decided that this approach is not for you, there are some good alternatives out there in the form of different libraries. The most straightforward one is Roomy Playdate by Robert Curry, a sort of drop-in scene management library. It's quite similar to my approach, but with a lot more features, like a pause scene that preserves the sprite in the scene you're switching from, though I believe you have to create your own transitions. 
Another alternative is the Noble engine, which is much less drop-in since you'll have to design your entire game around the engine, but it comes with a complete scene lifestyle management system, much more representative of a fully fledged game engine. It also has over a dozen built-in transition types, which is pretty cool. And the last alternative I have in mind is Cotton, which is like pulp, but on steroids. It uses its own pulp script alternative called Cotton Script and has a level editor built in, which is much more friendly for beginner developers. Of course, it also has built-in scene management. This is a really cool project and seems to be a good alternative. Links are in the description and you can check out the scene manager code in the GitHub link in the description. See you next week.